The first type of UML diagram that we looked at, a use case diagram, is more helpful on the behavioral side of things because it allows us to see how actors in a system play together along with different use cases, how these things all interact together. However, the next type of diagram that we're going to look at is called a domain model or a class diagram, often superimposed, and it's going to help us see how we might architect the technical side of things. However, don't get freaked out because there's still no programming involved and you could even make a domain model even as a non-developer. A domain model is going to take the elements from our use case diagram, the nouns as you'll see in a minute, and map them as classes as well as their associations and attributes. Let's hop right back into our library use case diagram. We identified several elements in this diagram, a librarian, a borrower, and most central to this whole operation, a book. Let's add a book as our first element to the domain model. It's as simple as drawing a rectangle and writing the word book, the singular name of the object, at the top. I'll now draw a line underneath where we'll list the attributes of a book. So, this is a book. What are the attributes of a book? A book can have many different things. It can have a title, an author, a year of publication, a category, many different things. It can even have a cover illustration. But not all of these attributes are going to be relevant for our domain model. We didn't see all of these mentioned in our use case diagram, so we don't need to add them all as attributes here to the book for the sake of the library. I'm back here on my diagram and can start listing out the attributes that are actually relevant in the library scenario. Basically, in a library, it's important that a book have a title, an author, a category, and an ISBN, which stands for International Standard Book Number. You can think of it as a type of universal book ID. Like I said, a book can also have many other things, like an illustration or a version number. At the moment, these aren't important attributes for our library system, or at least not yet. However, even if I'm not adding these attributes about the book now to my domain model, I can always add them in a future iteration if, when seeking feedback from collaborators or users, people tell me it's actually important to have the cover illustration of the book in my database somewhere. Now, you'll notice I'm writing all the attributes of the book in lowercase. This is a UML standard, and actually, if there were going to be compound words in here, we would write them in camel case, which you'll see shortly. Now we'll go ahead and add other objects to our diagram, including the librarian, the borrower, and the library itself. What types of attributes might a librarian have? Well, certainly, for the sake of our system, they should have a first name and a last name so that we can identify the librarian themselves. You'll notice I wrote these in camel case, meaning that the first letter of the first word is in lowercase, and the first letter of the second word is in uppercase. You'll see this often in programming if you're not familiar with it already. I'll go ahead and add the same attributes to my borrower, because my borrower probably also has a first name and a last name, like John Smith. I'll also add an attribute called balance to this class, because I need to be able to keep track of the borrower's late fees that were assessed, as I saw in my use case diagram. Now for the library, this is pretty simple. We can just say that my library has a name and an address. Now we've gained a little bit of clarity on our objects by diagramming them like this. We know some of their attributes. However, I wouldn't say that we've gained a ton of clarity about how these objects interact with each other. Let's do that now in the domain model by adding associations. In order to create associations within a domain model, you'll simply draw a line from one object to another. However, it gets a little bit more complicated once we talk about the number of each thing associated with the number of another thing. A simple line doesn't give us much information, so in order to say how many of one object are associated with another object, we can think of this with a particular syntax. We can say how many of me for the other. Let's take a look at how this actually plays out in our domain model. Let's take a simple relationship first. It's actually the first one that we diagrammed in the use case the relationship of a book to a borrower. We're going to put a number on each side closest to each rectangle to indicate how many of one for the other. Let's ask ourselves the question, how many borrowers does a book have? How many borrowers for one particular book? Well, in theory, only one person can borrow a book at a time, so I would put the number one right next to the rectangle that says borrower. However, this is not the same number that we're going to put next to the book rectangle when we ask ourselves the question, how many books for a borrower? People can check out a lot of books at a library. In fact, I think some libraries already have unlimited policies. So we could say that, for example, a borrower could check out zero books if they're not particularly interested in reading, or they could check out a ton of books, and we have no way of knowing what that particular number might be. 
The way we write that out in this diagram is zero dot dot star. This means somewhere in the range from zero to infinity or just a general number we don't know, that's the number of books associated with a borrower. I can fill out these same numbers for each association that I have in my domain model. For example, connecting librarian to library, how many librarians do I have for a library? Well, I could have one. In fact, I definitely need one. I can't really have a library without a librarian. Or I could have many. I could have five or ten. So I'll write one dot dot star next to my librarian class to indicate that at minimum I have one, or I could have many. It's somewhere in that range. Next to the library class, however, for that same association, there's only going to be one library per librarian because we don't want our librarian working at 20 different libraries because that would not be smart. So I'll put just the number one next to library to indicate for how many libraries there are for a librarian. To be succinct, I'll fill out the rest of these numbers myself and let you decipher them a little bit later as you explain this domain model and interpret it on your own time. Lastly, in our domain model, we can add some verbs. Right now, there's a lot of nounage going on. So let's spice it up and add some action to this domain model by talking about what classes actually do with one another. Now we can hop back to basic English, in fact. So what is the relationship between a book and a borrower? The borrower borrows the book. So to this diagram, I can add the word borrows on my association line. How does a librarian interact with a book? A librarian stocks a book, so I can actually add the word stocks to my association line here. What is the association between a librarian and a library? A librarian works at a library, so I'll go ahead and add works at to that association line. If you've ever worked with databases before, you understand that they're set up like a kind of Excel spreadsheet, where you have different columns that are all attributes associated with a particular object. Now, in our domain model here, we have a pretty good setup for a database. For example, just from this, we know that we need to create a table called the book table that's going to have a list of all our books in the system. This is pretty elementary as far as domain models go, but actually a great starting point so that we know we can design a system, a library system, and design it well without adding things that we don't need and without forgetting things that we do. At this point, you've seen two different types of UML diagrams. You've seen one from the more behavioral side of things. This was our use case diagram with the two little stick figures on both sides. And you've also seen one from the more technical side of things that would help with a database schema, for example. This was our domain model. Now, I mentioned that there are 14 types of UML diagrams, and in this course, we're not going to cover them all. However, having identified the key elements of your system through these two types of diagrams will help you so much with designing the rest of the diagrams that actually all kind of build one upon the other. In order to solidify your knowledge, we're going to look at two examples later in this course in the next chapters that will allow you to take what you learned in terms of theoretical knowledge, how to make these diagrams with actors and subjects, all sorts of jargon, and put them into practice yourself based on hearing interviews with people in a certain system. So now pack your bags, we're gonna head to the airport and listen to a real interaction between an airline agent and a passenger so we can appropriately design a system in order to handle airline reservations.